It's fantastic to be with you. I feel like I'm finally settling in here, so that's good. Um, hey, a quick recap on where we've been. We, uh, we decided a couple weeks ago that we have wrapped up our series on uh, being called. It was after our roundtable Sunday. I, we all kind of looked around at each other and said, I think the, the calling series is done. Uh, it was a fantastic series. It spoke to a lot of people and, and had a profound impact. And uh, Baron, you're kind enough to record these things. And so you can go online and, and see his work and, and revisit uh, those sermons if you would like. And then we had Roundtable Sunday where Jana expertly led us on what it meant to be sent. And we had some good discussions around the table. And that was fantastic as well. And, and now we're diving into a new series. And it's going to be on uh, the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to kind of walk through that for the rest of summer here. And uh, the way that I want to kind of get us thinking about the fruit of the Spirit is by, as I said, sharing with you one of my hobbies, which is uh, fireworks, of which are connected to the 4th of July. I brought some no lighters, please. Um, I thought that would be fun too, but maybe not so safe. Um, <laughs> But I love fireworks. Fireworks are cool. And one of the things I love about them is this little package doesn't tell you what's about to happen. <laughs> um, some of them look similar. I might have an idea of what's going to happen. I think it's going to launch into the air. It's going to explode. And then there'll probably be some colors. But I don't know if it'll be a ring of red with some gold or if it'll be some blue and then some purple or if it'll crackle or if it'll whistle or, or what. There's always a little bit of surprise and a lot of similarity, and it will be beautiful and fun and exciting. Um, when we become Christ followers, it's almost as though God lights a fuse in us, and something is going to come out of that, and it's going to be beautiful, and it's going to be surprising. And I never know quite what it's going to look like, but it's going to have some similarity, and I'm going to look around and go, man, that's a God thing. That's cool what God is doing in that person's life. Sometimes it's dramatic and, and happens right away. Uh, for me, I was a very depressed individual. When I became a Christian, I, I uh, for some odd reason, started experiencing joy. Uh, that was new to me, and it sort of oozed out of me. Um, but that happened really quick. For, for other times, I think it's just been little small things that God has been working on in me for years and years. And you might not even know it's happening because I was in so need of that work. And, and God just kind of gradually is birthing something out of us in a, in a beautiful way. And so um, when we think about the fruit of the Spirit, that's what we're talking about. Is What is it that God is bringing out of us as we attach ourselves to him, as we let him work in our lives, and as we give him control of of who we are. We each have very unique, different gifts, skills, and abilities, and you all bring amazing strengths, and you're all made incredibly different, and and it's so good to be with you because of the diversity that is even in this room. Um, But there's ways that we're also very similar. God's going to bring some similarness out of us, and Paul is addressing that as he begins to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. So I'm going to read for us this passage that we're going to be focused on for summer. Um, I'm going to kind of read it a little bit longer because I want us to get us get it in context. I want us to see where Paul is going with this overall thought. And it's Galatians 5, 19 through 26. Here's what it says. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Okay, how I kind of see this passage is a little bit like a road trip I took. I was uh, taking it from Arizona to Seattle. I had lived in Arizona at the time, and I had a friend who needed to get from Arizona to Portland. Um, And so we figured, hey, we can do this road trip together, share the driving a little bit. Um, 
and we can get there quick. We're not even gonna book any sort of like stopovers. We're just gonna cruise. And that's, I don't know, a 26 hour drive, something like that. So, um, so we hop in the car, we've got everything packed in there and uh, my traveling companion says to me, um, I don't own a car and I'm not used to driving. So, oh, true, this could be interesting. So I said, all right, I'll, I'll do most of the driving. I'm, I'm pretty hardcore, I can handle this. Um, and so I drove and I drove and I drove and I got really, really tired while driving and it was getting late. It's like three o'clock in the morning and um, I'm like, I, I just can't do it anymore. We've rolled down the windows, the music is cranked, I'm just getting tireder and tireder. And uh, when you fight with tiredness, tiredness always wins. So, uh, we pull off into a rest stop and I say, I can't do it anymore, you have to drive. So, so here's what I need you to do. Pull back onto I-5, get in the left lane, and stay there. I'm gonna sleep for an hour or so. And then I will take over. And um, so I roll back the seat and it, I'm out. Hour and a half later, I wake up and the car is bouncing a little bit because we're on this little tiny rocky road. We're heading now east into the Mojave Desert <laughs> and the fuel light is on. And I'm thinking, this is not good. <laughs> so we switch driving again and I ask what happened and uh, my, my co-driver was not comfortable uh, in the left lane, it was too fast decided to be in the right lane and in the right lane there's all the exits and one of the exits took her into an east direction on a little tiny road out into the desert so i prayed that the lord would get us back to i-5 where we could get gas and that we would not be stuck in the desert um and he was good and he took care of us but uh this passage that we just looked at paul kind of says there's all these other things that can take you in a direction that is absolutely opposite where you want to go it'll take you into a desert that will not be life-giving but if you will give me the wheel if you let me drive i can pull you in the right direction and i can have you headed towards these good things love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control those are the sorts of things that god can bring about in us the reason why I share that is I think this text is not a list of rules of how Christians should act. And I've seen a lot of that. I'm like, oh, I need to try to be more gentle. That's what I'm gonna, gonna focus on right now. I'm gonna, it's not a to-do list. It's certainly not a list to, to quote to your spouse or your <laughs> child as they are struggling with any of these particular fruits. Well, the fruit of the spirit, you know, have a little more patience. Um, these are qualities, and they're also kind of like a road trip in that they take a while to develop. I think it's really hard to notice this on like a moment by moment basis. You can see God at work trying to like put you in spots where you might learn patience, but uh, it's better to look over the long haul and say, this month or this year or this decade, does it look like I'm getting to be more joy-filled or less joy-filled? More patient or less patient? What's happening in our lives? And if we find that we're becoming more like this, praise God, he is bringing that out of us. His spirit is at work. And if those qualities feel like they're receding, it's a good time to go, man, how did I get disconnected from God? Because that's some of what happens when we go on the road without God. And I love that it's called fruit. Um, think of a fruit tree, man. We were outside walking our dog. There's a cherry tree right next door and it's it's starting to pop out some cherries and we went over and the dog was scarfing them all up and uh but i doubt that that cherry tree is sitting there going okay now i've got to figure out a 10-step plan for how i'm not going to produce apples but i am going to produce cherries that's ridiculous these trees bear that fruit because that's what they are we're christians and we bear these fruit because the spirit is in us and that's what he brings out. Um, I don't think that that cherry tree sits there and goes, all right, more effort to the right branch. Oh! <clears throat> it's natural, it's organic, it's beautiful, but it takes being in step with the spirit. Paul has that language in there. Let us walk with the spirit, let's be in step with the spirit. Since the spirit is in us, that is what happens. 
and then we find ourselves growing. Now, uh, this is sort of an ADD sermon. There's your intro to the whole fruit of the spirit thing. I get the joy of tackling that very first one, and I'm so excited because I think it's the primary one and the most important one. But I get to tackle this first fruit of the spirit, which is love. And uh, love is the great defining characteristic of Christians. Jesus said they'll know you by your love. Love has the power to take hatred and evil. We saw it in Charleston this week of a situation where everyone has every reason to be wrathful. And yet what's responded is forgiveness and prayers for this young man from that community. Incredible. Uh, love stops war. Retaliation does not. Uh, a beautiful softness and beautiful life-giving things can come out of horrible situations when they are encountered with love. And love is weird to talk about because we could sit here all day and talk about it. But when we see it, it's profound and it's, it's beautiful. And I hope as you follow, followed what's going on in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, with that uh, young man who came in and murdered those folks up at a Bible study, that you have seen how they've responded. Because it struck me this week that that was what love looks like. And it seemed redundant to get up and talk about it after that. I want to share some quotes from you, uh, from some of the families of those uh, victims. Daniel Simmons was the grandson of a 74-year-old, or the grandson of 74-year-old Daniel Simmons said this, although my grandfather and the other victims died at the hands of hate, this is proof that everyone's playing for this young man's soul, is proof that they lived in love and that their legacy will be love. Hate won't win. Charleston's mayor said this, a hateful person came into our community with some crazy idea that he'd be able to divide us. But all he did was unite us and make us love each other more. And 49-year-old DePayne Middleton doctor said this, for me, I am a work in progress. I am very angry, but we are a family that love built. There's no room for hate, so I'll find a way to forgive honest it's real love wins it overtakes darkness it's no surprise that paul would say love is the first of the fruit of the spirit listen to how he talks about love in first corinthians we just sang a song that was hearkening to this if i speak in the tongues of men or of angels but i don't have love i'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal if i have the gift of prophecy if i can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love I am nothing and if I give all that I possess to the poor if I give over my body to hardships that I may boast but I do not love I gain nothing all of that unique beautiful stuff that God put in you that tremendous gifting that those talents those strengths you can have all of that, but if it's not coupled with love, it's nothing. Love is vital and powerful. And if we're going to follow Christ, if we're going to walk in step with the Spirit, it's going to be walking in love. Jesus in Mark 12, 31 sums up the entire scripture. If you want the easiest way to try to follow this God thing, boiled down, Jesus said this. Here it is. You want to sum it all up? Love the Lord your God all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength and all of your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. It's interesting that when asked to sum up all of scripture, Jesus says it's two things, love God, love people. But I also think it's tricky to figure out what does it mean to love someone? I mean, it's hard in situations because it gets messy, but even in our culture, it's hard to figure out love. Uh, love is one of those things that there is so much stuff going around about that it's hard to identify it at times. I um, drive for Uber, as some of you might know. I drive around people. I love to listen to 80s music while I drive, uh, much to the chagrin of some of my customers, I'm sure. But uh, that was my glory days of music. So um, this week, while I was driving around and thinking of the sermon, Howard Jones's song came on, uh, What is Love Anyway? And Does Anybody Love Anyone? Anyway, I thought it was a worthy question uh, because most songs are busy singing about love. 
I read somewhere that 90% of songs are about love. Every movie we watch has a love story in it. You notice that? It's crazy. You go to an action flick hoping to see cars drive really fast and what you get is a love story somewhere in the middle of it. Does Transformers really need a love story to stand in some movie? That's my question. So much stuff about love. It feels like the internet. When you search something, occasionally you get so many responses that you can't even find the real answer. And uh, when I look at all the stuff going around about love, what is love anyway? Is it the warm fuzzies like it's depicted in movies that make you want to reach out your hand to someone that you love and give them a kiss? Is it, is it that attraction? Well, maybe. Is it fate, how it brings two people together unstoppably through incredibly uh, difficult situations so that they can be together and live happily ever after? Well, I think there's more to love than that. Is it just preferences? I love fireworks. I love dogs. You don't love fireworks and you don't love dogs. I mean, that's preferences. Uh, but you do love pie, so maybe we can get together. Like, we just love all sorts of funny ways. And um, I've occasionally been sitting around in Christian Bible studies and things where somebody said, man, I just wish I understood the Greek. Because it would clear everything up. And I want you to know, as somebody who has studied Greek and looked at the word for love in Greek, it is equally messy in Greek. Even if you've heard a sermon that categorized the four types of love, it was still messier than that. Um, but we know it when we see it, don't we? Mother Teresa caring for the poor, that's love. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, the way he spoke about both sides of the racial divide, there was love there. Jesus uh, points us to the pinnacle of love, it's sort of like the uh, landmark we can use to head that direction, I think. Sometimes when I'm driving around, I'm like, okay, I need to go south. Where's the space needle? Done. I know where I'm going. John 15, 13, Jesus says this. Greater love has no one than this, than that he would lay down his life for his friends. Jesus characterized love as this, laying down our life for the sake of somebody else. That's the dynamic of love. It it moves oneself out of the way, and it and it, the object of its love becomes the purpose for what it does. Those folks in Charleston, it is not easy to say words like "we forgive you," "we plead for you," "we hope you take this opportunity to repent," because we want good things for your life to this young man. And yet, they have chosen to set aside their own hate, their own rights everything in them that is hurting and say, no, you're the object of our love still. That is crazy to me, but it's beautiful too. Laying down our lives, laying down our agendas and our wants. Um, it's Father's Day. Great fathers know how to love. They set aside themselves for the sake of the one that they um, are loving for their child. And I know that maybe we've experienced that, maybe we haven't, but one of the thoughts that's helpful to me in this is um, Plato. He, he talked about the true form of things, and he kind of put it this way. Imagine it, a perfect apple. It is symmetrical. It is glorious. The fruit tastes just right. It's just the right amount of crispness. Uh, but every apple you come across is not that apple. It's got some dings on it. It might have a bruise here or there. Maybe you bite into it and you've got a soft spot. Uh, but it's still very good. And in so much as it resembles that perfect apple, it's apple and it's good. Um, if we imagine the perfect parent, if we think of a Heavenly Father who is perfect, it is that love. And, and even if uh, our parents have failed us in some ways or we have encountered bruises uh, along the way as a result, we might still agree that if we looked at the perfect parent, we would expect that they would lay aside their sleep, their resources, that college fund didn't just get there, uh, their dreams, they begin to dream about what their kid might do instead of what they might do. Love is a sacrificial word, uh, and I think it's more that than a warm, fuzzy word. It's more than a word of what I get from somebody is these nice feelings, but a word of what I'm able to give this person is this. That's love. Despite what we might want, I think the greatest form of love is when we look at somebody else and we say, 
How can I help them on their way? And some of you are profoundly good at loving others. And that's the shift, self to Christ. Christ who says, I love you so much, I would lay down my very life for you. And now you go love other people that way. That's love. So, how do we bring this into this week? I always try and shoot for that, because um, I think it's helpful to have a little to-do, a little bit of homework. John's smart in giving us that, I think. Um, first, I want to use it as a reminder for uh, the word of grace. God loves us, and he is perfect, and that means we have a love that is with us, uh, that is deeper and better than any we have ever known. Um, we're not always aware of it, but it's there. Think back to that perfect parent. A uh, kid hurts themselves. They, they fall down. They get a big gash. Uh, what's that parent doing? Comforting them, putting on a bandage, trying to figure out if they need to go to the hospital, doing whatever it is that they have to do to get that person well again. Do you think of God like that in your life? Do we think, hey, man, God is with me. He's, he's working with me. Get me back on my feet. He's there to comfort me. Do we turn to him in those difficult challenges or a kid does something great you know it doesn't even have to be huge one strikeout even though the whole game was a disaster that kid got one strikeout and I have seen a parent posting up on Facebook oh my gosh my kid threw a strikeout today yes he walked 18 batters <laughs> but he threw his first strikeout today I'm so proud of him do you think of God like that in your life that God is actually walking with you. And even though it might feel small and insignificant to you, God is going to be going, yes! I celebrate you. I celebrate what you were able to do. God loves us so much that he would lay down our life, his life for us. Why would we not think that God would be with us like that? Now, the second thing that that leads to is a challenge. If God loves us like this, and the world needs his love, the way he likes for that to happen is for us to show that love to others. So, how do we move ourselves out of the center and love other people around us? Think small and think practical. It's easier to tackle how to love somebody today in simple ways than it is to tackle how am I gonna love somebody over the next decade? I have some silly little examples. Coffee for a coworker especially the coworkers sometimes who nobody wants to take to coffee. It makes a profound effect. I had a friend who brought back Frosties when he would go to Wendy's for everybody in the office. Little thing, but it made an impact. Or how about this? I have another friend who, who somehow the conversation is always about me when I'm with them because they're good at asking questions and it sneaks up on me. So this week, my way of loving people I'm going to try to ask more questions about them than talk about myself. That's my goal. Simple. Or family. Uh, I'm going down to my sister's wedding next week. How can I best cheer her on in her marriage? What's going to be my plan for that? Talked about that circle of influence. There's lots of people that we come across. Everyone is an opportunity for us to love. Let's find a way to do it. So the question from my 80s song, what is love anyway? It's laying down our lives for those around us. Does anybody love anyone? Absolutely, with the Holy Spirit's help. So let's go make it happen. That's the goal. Sound good? All right, let's pray. God, thank you for your deep, deep love for us. We don't always recognize it in the depth of it, but you have loved us so much that you laid down your very life for us. God, thanks for being with us, cheering us on, encouraging us, uh, bringing forth fruit in our lives that is good, that is life-giving, not only to us, but to those around us. Keep up the good work and help us to be attentive to you this week. And Lord, show us ways that we can love practically, simply, uh, those around us. Thank you for this community and the ways that we encourage one another along the way. Help us to be a community that love built. We love you, Lord. Amen.